Why don't we just say a little prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Grace, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, my name is Father Thomas Joseph White, and it's a great honor to be here at the Napa Institute and to talk to you all today about the topic, Can Beauty Save the World? Thomas Aquinas on Beauty and Evangelization. I'm from Washington, D.C., from the Thomistic Institute there. Father Dominic Legg, who is here, is the director of that institute, and we put on uh, intellectual events of Catholic philosophy and theology primarily on secular campuses. And uh, I'm taking that project also now to the Angelicum at Rome, so we're going to, as it were, create a branch of the Thomistic Institute's work in the Eternal City. And so we're happy to talk to you sort of in a way that we talk to our students on campus about the perennial wisdom of the Catholic Church and the gift of Thomas Aquinas' thought, which helps illumine contemporary issues. So the phrase, can beauty save the world, that short question is a riff on a phrase from Dostoevsky's book, The Idiot, in which, in which you hear this phrase, uh, which is posed to the main character, Prince Mushkin, uh, is it true, Prince, that you once said, it is beauty that will save the world? What kind of beauty will save the world? You are a diligent Christian, aren't you? Koila asserts to me that you appear as a Christian. And so Dostoevsky's skeptical character is posing the question of whether beauty can save the world. Can the world be saved? Does Christianity have something to do with this? Is beauty a sort of a trace of mystery in reality? And I'm going to come back to that kind of interesting modern question at the end of the talk. But what I want to do uh, to get there is briefly give you Thomas Aquinas's definition of beauty, uh, which is something that is uh, deceptively simple, and which I've been myself very imperfectly trying to think about for about 20 years and have realized is incredibly profound, like a lot of ideas of Aquinas. It looks very simple. It's utterly profound. You can think about it for your lifetime. And then I want to look at uh, notes of beauty. Well, I'll give you examples from natural beauty so that we make sure we see the principle a little bit, a la Thomas Aquinas. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about artistic beauty and then finish with talking about beauty and evangelization. So when Aquinas writes about uh, the three properties of beauty that he uses to define it, he gives three fundamental words in Latin, which translate effectively directly into our English, integritas, proportionalitas, and claritas. Integrity, or wholeness, proportionality, sometimes he calls it consonance also, uh, sort of fittingness, harmony. And the third is claritas, we, you could talk about it in English as splendor, but also kind of a clarity, a brightness, uh, a shining kind of uh, quality, or, but it's used analogically. So these three features of beauty, Aquinas says, enter into all things, that insofar as things exist, they are in some way beautiful, and so they in some sense have these three properties or notes of beauty. And it's true not only of natural realities, which I'm about to talk about, but also of artifacts, artif artifactual realities, especially artistic creations. Okay, so that sounds maybe very abstract. Let's use a concrete example and you know, see if we can track where this is going, and then I'll expand the examples. And the, the key thing is that this concept of beauty for Aquinas is analogical, meaning it doesn't just fit into one specific definition of thing, like you know, all that is beautiful is in accord with being a lion. Therefore, only lions are beautiful. Uh, well, I mean, lions are one noble species of thing, and they are beautiful in their own way, but uh, human beings are beautiful, trees are beautiful, uh, poems are beautiful, uh, even, even clothing can be beautiful, so forth and so on. So it, it just goes into every register. That's kind of what we mean by analogical. It has a kind of a range, a transcendent range of, of expression. Okay, so just in your minds, I take a tree that you think is very beautiful and very noble, 
I think, and I'm saying this make, to make the president of Thomas Aquinas College happy, but I think often of the tree that's in the main quad of Thomas Aquinas College in front of their chapel, if you, it's a Tolkien-esque tree, it's just glorious. And uh, so if you think about like integritas, wholeness, to, for a form, any kind of reality to be beautiful, it has to have a kind of holistic composition. So think about like a beautiful oak tree in, let's say you have a very large front lawn and you have a, a very beautiful noble oak tree in, at, at it. And then the power line company comes, and they, they, they cut a limb off to put in the power lines. And it makes the tree less beautiful. Why? Well, they've mutilated the integrity of the tree. They've like taken off a major branch and now the wholeness of the form has been ruptured. Or, you know, I think you could think about a, somebody who's a vet who I live near the, you know, the, um, uh, the hospital in D.C. where they have a lot of the vets who come back from Afghanistan or Iraq and they, you know, sometimes because of a mine have lost a limb and, you, you know, it's not beautiful. It is, there's a disintegrity to the human body. Like that's a kind of violence to the, the beautiful form of the body. Okay, so then the tree doesn't just have this wholeness of all its branches and parts, but because it's whole, there's, this com there's composite parts, and that's the proportionality. So, so there's quantity and quality. So the quantity is like you've got multiple branches, like sort of extended, and they're proportionately extended in spatial ways regarding each other that there's a kind of beauty that emerges as the tree uh, limbs are proportionately distant from each other, proportionally close to one another. So there's a kind of like dance that the, your eye does looking at all the kind of beautiful integrity of the proportionate quantitative expressions of the branches. But then there's also qualities, like the color of the tree. The tree is gray, but it has green leaves. And then if it's a dogwood tree, it has white flowers. So you've got the gray and the green and you've got the white, and they're all proportionally spaced quantitatively. So you've got the quantitative spacing of the trees, the branches, the flowers, you've got the qualitative differences of the colors. That's proportionality. And so proportionality, you might say, is the kind of expression of integrity. The in integral form of the tree is expressed through the proportionate quantities and qualities, right? And then out of that, you get the last property, which is splendor or or claritas, it's the hardest to talk about, but it's something like the, the gloriousness or, of the form of the thing when it reaches its perfect expression. So when you look at the tree, you know, you're looking at this magnificent tree, it has this wholeness, this integrity, there's this proportionality of all the branches and parts and how they're kind of magnificent, and then there's the colors and the qualities of those that are proportioned to each other, and you think that is a splendid tree. There's a beauty, there's a, a sort of a, um, you know, a claritas or a, uh, a glory to that tree in the way that it just dominates the, uh, the, uh, the, the horizon. Okay, it's a simple illustration, but it's one that I think everyone can identify with. Now what I wanna do is, having just given you a fundamental definition, I wanna expand you, so why I say it's deceptively simple definition is because you, you can now move with it and like use it to look at other things. So, Let's just go up and down the arc, well, actually up, the hierarchy of being. So let's take non-living things, then let's look at plants or that kind of, you know, I just give an illustration, but maybe we'll come back to something like plants. And then we'll go up to living animals that are non-rational, then we'll go up to rational animals, and then maybe we'll say a brief word about God, the author of all things. Okay, so um, take, just, let's just take an example of something that's kind of evidently beautiful at the non-living level. Um, and this is a place where uh, actually modern microscopes and the computer make uh, this illustration more interesting. And that's the, in that's the interesting example of the snowflake. So if you go online and look at high resolution microscopic photos of snowflakes, Maybe that's not what you do with your spare time. Maybe you're, you're probably watching cat videos like everybody else in America, but we'll come to cats in a minute. But, but, do, but look, at, look, look at the National Ge Geographic pictures of the snowflake. And I mean, it is amazing. I mean, in terms of like the detail of uh, symmetry in them. Okay, so the first thing is that's obvious. Uh, you know, every one of them is crystallized a little differently, and I don't know the science of that, but the, f the fact of the matter is they're all kind of very individual. So you look at the snowflake, and the first thing that's obvious is the integrity of the form. They have these incredible, coherent, holistic, geometrical forms, just on a visual level. There's an integrity, a holistic character. And then, of course, proportionality. There's all this beautiful proportionality of the parts 
And it, these are natural formations. They're microscopic, but they're, they're magnificent. And because they have this wholeness and proportionality, when you can see them at scale, that's proportion to our eye, for example, through modern technology means, they're splendid. You know, so there's a kind of clarity to them. There's um, other ways you might uh, uh, think about something like the Grand Canyon, which is an, uh, that's more like, that's a kind of experience of beauty that has a certain um, sublimity to it. I think sublimity has to do with vastness of scale. And so like the ocean is sublime or a mountain that's magnificent is sublime. The Grand Canyon is sublime. That's where you see just like a magnitude uh, they, there's an integrity to the Grand Canyon. You, it's hard to see it. You, you know, you go to special places to try to see, to get a glimpse of something of the integrity of it. You can't see all of it at once because it's just too big, but you can see a large portion of the Grand Canyon from the right angles in the right uh, places, and you can get a sense of the scale, and then you can see all the different colors and the different sort of, as it were, rock formations and get a sense of the depth of it and the parts of it, and that gives you a sense of the kind of vast, sublime, uh, splendor of, of that natural rock formation. So you can use the definition a little bit in a plastic way, in a flexible way, to talk about non-living things. Well, I did talk about already the vegetative example of the tree, but we could just take another example like the rose. People give these to each other as expressions of affection. Well, of course, but, but why actually? Uh, well, because of their beauty. Now, there's a lot of aspects to them. The, I mean, clearly there's the integrity of the, the, the mini petals that hold together, and then there's the proportionality of how they are all kind of uh, related to one another, and the sort of splendidness of the rosebud's form. Uh, and, you know, you can also say they have perfumed odor, so there's a sort of beauty of, to the odor of them as well as the sort of sublime, sublimity of their, of their appearance. Okay. Let's move to animal life, and I'm giving just brief examples to sort of show you why I think this is a great definition of Aquinas. Take an animal that most human beings would consider a beautiful animal, like a horse. Um, I think some, you could talk about, I mean, you know, there's interesting questions here. People talk about beauty being subjective. I actually think it's, it's not so much the subjective as that we don't have, uh, we've lost the tradition of analysis of it and thinking about the canons of beauty. And, and, and analysis. So I think we probably could talk about why one, one animal is more beautiful than another. Like why do we think that um, horses have a kind of more noble form than, I don't know what, um, rats? Or <laughs> why, why is the, I mean the pug is, a, the, the pug is a very, you know, absolutely cute animal, but it's not as noble as the golden retriever. And so there's interesting questions there about the beauty of the pug, the limited beauty of the pug versus the beauty <laughs> of the, the golden retriever. But if you take a kind of non-controversial example, at least on an intuitive level, we want to say horses are beautiful. Well, okay, there's an integrity to them, right? We want them to not break their legs. And you can, it, there's movies made that make children cry about where a horse breaks its leg and you have to shoot it and this kind of thing. Um, you know, it, it's, it's grave and it's tragic because people sense there's a kind of nobility to this animal. And that requires it to have its totality, its integrity of bodily form. And in the case of the animal, unlike the plant or the non-living thing, it really expresses that through the vitality of movement and sense life. So, I mean, really the horse, where do we acknowledge its beauty most is when the horse is charging, when it's running. And uh, we watch films about that, or we, 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 people go and watch them run against each other, uh, in, uh, like, uh, you know, or maybe just own them to watch them run. It's, it's uh, partly because the living form, the power of the animal, its capacity to run, the elegance, the beauty, what you have there is not just the integrity of the bodily form, but the proportionality of the limbs, the rapidity of the, of the pace of the animal. Um, just the incredible vitality that's exuded when it's ch when it's galloping, and um, you know you also there's things about horses that are r connected to this, like the refinement of their senses. They're actually emotionally delicate animals, so they you know, can have a kind of connection to their riders or to their owners that's peculiar and individual uh, through the habituation of their sense life and their memory. So there's something you know really interestingly complex about how these animals work in the midst of that terrific integrity and unity. And we can talk about for about the kind of splendidness or the nobility of this horse. Uh, and, that, and that's just a, you know, one example from a, a living physical form. We could talk about you know, human beauty and the, the beauty of the face and the integrity, symmetry, proportions of the face and things like that. 
But let me turn with human beings then to spiritual beauty. Um, there's that movie that's called A Beautiful Mind. We can talk about a person having a beautiful argument or a beautiful thoughts. So what would it mean to say that, well, did you read that article, that academic article? Yeah, I did. What did you think? It was boring. Oh, did you read this one? Yeah, I did. What did you think? I thought it was beautiful. Oh, why did you think that, that article is beautiful? Well, first of all, the argument is so sound. Like, he starts from very sound premises, and he argues uh, from, you know, A to B to C to D really fluidly. So there's an integrity to the argument. There's like a wholeness, right? So that it could be a wholeness to a spiritual thing, like uh, uh, to the truth. Like he gave us the, the whole truth and there was an integrity to it. He didn't give us a part, he gave us the whole truth. And it was so beautiful. I could see all the parts and how they fit together. And there's, they're all proportionate to one another. Right? So that you see, you see how harmonies uh, uh, begin, begin to uh, be evinced in the way people make arguments or, or express the truth. There's wholeness, there's proportionality, and so then you sense splendor. You know, well, we kept asking him the hard questions, and he kept answering the hard questions, and he just, you got this sense of a continual truth, and it, it just fit together. There was this integrity to it, this proportionality. All the parts fit together, and it was sort of splendid. Why was it? Because you perceive the truth in the argument. Your mind perceived the form of the truth. Like your eyes see the form of the tree, your mind perceives the form of the truth. You know, or like, more, so that's like intellectual beauty. And there's other ways we could illustrate intellectual beauty. But this is like moral beauty. Moral beauty is when there's a, so you say like, well, he, his honesty is really impeccable. I work with this lawyer, his honesty is impeccable. And you say, well, <laughs> Why is that exceptional? Well, I live in Washington D.C. You know, it's really it's difficult. <laughs> it's a difficult place for lawyers are under lots of pressure and duress, and there's lots of you know political or economic pressures on them, and they could compromise on the truth or they could be, become ruthless. But what's so amazing is about that is no matter how exacting the circumstances, this guy's always honest. He shows a certain zeal for the truth and integrity. Okay, there's an in, we talk about character as integrity. Often what we mean is that a virtue, like the person follows through. Like they're not just honest when it's convenient or honest most of the time. They're like perpetually and consistently honest. There's a wholeness there. Like it, so I see the virtue of honesty because they're like holistically honest in all these different circumstances. And you see it in somebody and you say, gosh, that person's really got an integrity of the virtue of honesty. And that means, what's the proportionality? Well, that's a, it's usually, it's quantitative and qualitative. They, they do it habitually, frequently, easily. They're easily honest. They don't struggle. They don't like suffer temptation. They're just, they have a vi vital honesty. But also they're honest in the right way, in the right circumstance, you know? They, they're gentle in this circumstance, they're, they're forceful in that one. They're just in this circumstance, they're merciful in that one. So that the way they tell, the way you tell the truth is humane if you tell the truth in the right way, in the right time to the right person. You know, so there's like judgments of prudence. Of, you don't ever lie, but how do you tell the truth in the right way, the right person, the right time? And that, if you have that habit, that's a kind of, there's a kind of beauty to that. Like the way he found a way to tell him that hard truth in that context, that was beautiful. It's hard to do. Okay, so then you admire the virtue, the beauty of that person's honesty. Okay, I'll just say a last word here about the, the beauty of God. We don't see God. We don't have an image of the divine nature. At least as a philosopher, or as philosophers, we can say we have no natural access to the beauty of God. What we see are the works of God that are manifold and themselves beautiful. And because they are all coming from one source, we can conclude or divine that the effects must in some way resemble the cause. So God is not a physical body. The divine essence, God in his very nature and life is not a physical body. And God isn't a, like a didactic mind that works through stages. God doesn't read articles to figure out what he thinks during the day. And he's not going through moral training exercises to become honest. He doesn't develop the way we do, but he's created a world of physical things that are beautiful and living things that are beautiful and intellectual creatures that have intellectual beauty and moral creatures that have moral beauty. And so in some higher way, God is himself beautiful in his very being, in his life, in his divine knowledge of himself and his creation and in his divine goodness. And we don't know what that is. We know, Aquinas would say, we know that God is beautiful, but we have no direct experience of it. We, you might say, we infer it, we can reason constructively and uh, coherently and conclusively, 
that we know God is beautiful, but we don't have an in intuitive, immediate experience of God's beauty. And so part of what Revelation claims is that God has crossed the bridge toward us so that we don't just remain philosophers who know that God's beautiful but don't know God's beauty, but he's taken on our human form in becoming human to manifest divine beauty in the human life of uh, Christ so that in Christ's divine and human beauty, we see who God is, or something of more perfectly who God is. And we could talk, and I won't, but you could talk about the beauty of Christ's teaching, the beauty of Christ's miracles, the beauty of Christ's death, the beauty of Christ's resurrection from the dead, the beauty of Christ's life in the church, in the sacraments, and in the preaching of the church, and we could go on and on. And that's beauty on a theological register. And we could use that definition of, of integrity, proportionality, and splendor, and go through all those things you could talk about the, the integrity of Christ's body in the resurrection and the proportionality of his body and the glorified body. Why, why is it beautiful, the resurrection? But. So let me just turn now in this third part of the talk to talk a little bit about the arts. Now, I, I'm just presupposing something here that I'm not going to justify and that is that the different arts, if you talk about like the classical arts, you know, the seven classical arts, things like painting, music, poetry, architecture, um, uh, statuary, dance, drama, that in these classical arts, they're telling us something about what it is to be human. So I'm just presupposing that, and I have little ideas about that, and they'll come out, but I'm just going to allude to them. My point will be to illustrate the definition of beauty in each case. I'm just going to tell you what I think some of these, not all seven, I think, but some of these arts manifest about what it is to be human. And then I'm going to talk about how they manifest it through that threefold definition. So let me take the first example, which is probably the most intuitive for all of us, I think, if you think about beauty, and that would be painting. So painting is, of course, a visual medium. It usually is on a limited frame of a canvas, and it involves uh, the medium, sometimes a drawing, but more typically paint at least in classical painting, modern European painting, uh, paint expressing form. And so there's like a visual form, typically human, not always, but typically human beings appear as central prota protagonists. And then you've got some kind of background. It may be more abstract or it may be more realist. It could be a landscape, but it also could be a room, but it also could just be abstract colors. Uh, and through color then, you manifest through qualities of color, both form and a certain kind of perspective. So painting is sometimes called the most intellectual of the arts because it's directly connected to getting a perspective. I mean, it's literally, you're like looking visually, you know, non-metaphorically, you're looking, it's as if you're looking visually at something and getting a perspective on it. But of course, it's symbolic precisely so that in and through the visual experience of symbolism, you're also getting a perspective on reality. So, you know, if you think about mm, something poignant like, Van Gogh painting an elderly Dutch woman. And often she looks like worn out by her manual labor and slightly sad. You know, these, these incredibly saddening, melancholic works. The emotion is just vibrant. Uh, so you're not just looking at some person in her room, but you're getting a kind of perspective on her, her personhood. It's a kind of depth perspective, at least. Or maybe you're looking more at how, Fouc uh, Foucault, how uh, Van Gogh feels about the subject and his subjectivity, okay? So the point is, does the definition, my question is, does the definition work? Well, yeah, of course it does, because integritas, what are you showing in the painting? You've got the integrity, say, of the human form, and then the way it relates to all the other painting uh, moments in the painting. Like, is the background matching the foreground? So if you're like a painting instructor and somebody paints a beautiful, uh, realist painting of a person, and they try to do an abstract background, but like the colors are completely discordant, and they say, well, that's part of the idea. He said, no, no, listen, the colors, you need some kind of integrity to the way the whole thing fits together and a proportionality between the color scheme, right? So if you were designing your own apartment, by metaphor, if you're designing your own apartment, you put like one wall will be orange, one will be purple, one will be white, and one will be, you know, sharp green. It, it's, it's discordant. You know, so in painting, you want to have that kind of a integrity and then the proportionality between the different colors, but out of that, an integrity and proportionality of the human form so that you can manifest through that kind of intellectual and emotional ideas about the human person. So, for example, in icons of Christ, they're not necessarily realistic. You're kind of trying to show the spiritualized form 
of the reality of God among us. They're not uber realistic. I mean, Michelangelo's uber realistic, but um, Frangelico is somewhat in the middle. Giotto is very abstract, but in a kind of Neoplatonic way, he's trying to show like the splendor of the, of the human being, of God's grace in and through the human form. Um, just to take a couple more examples, say music. Okay, so music is temporal. That's the first, I mean, that's totally different than painting. Painting is like atemporal. It's like a perspective and it just remains. They, these paintings hang, for example, in the National Gallery and they're just there for centuries and people come and look at them. And it's like this, this perspective of the artist is just preserved. Music exists in time, not just in time for co in composition, but it's expressed in time. And what does it show you? It's, a very, it's much more linked to emotion. Uh, and it's, it, 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 it shows you how human beings, its integrity exists through a temporal sequence. So like say uh, uh, a friend of yours is playing the organ in church after mass and he's playing a Bach solo like ferociously and he just stops. Or maybe he stops because he decided it was time to pray and he was gonna stop play, performing for us. I mean, you'd be offended because he's disrupted the integrity of the piece, like finish the piece. And people sit around in church and they wait and they all clap because like there's an integrity, it's finished, right? So there's an integrity to the music. And then of course there's proportions of the, I mean, that's what the notes show you, all the proportions of the scales of music, the different qualities of music, and the tempo, the quantitative measure of how fast you play the notes and the qualitative measure of where the notes go. And out of that integrity of that sequence of notes, it's quantitative rhythm and it's qualitative diversity of notes, you have like the splendor of music. And it tells you something about human beings existing in time. And as Plato noted, good music forms the emotions uh, in view of kinds of virtues. So like religious music, it's like forming you in the virtue of piety. How do I pray in time? And there's times in the mass we have beautiful music to teach us how to give thanks to God or to venerate God. Okay, but there's also like, if you're running, you might listen to Gregorian chant, but you might listen to something like with drums and electric guitars because you're trying to get your irascible passions elevated to like jog to the music. Um, you know, so mu music has different kind of uh, educational properties of your emotions. So I should talk about architecture and just because that also affects, you know, Catholics. Um, architecture, it could be said in a, in a brief definition, teaches us how to inhabit the, a, a human space meaningfully. Like what, what is this space for and what is our common life together? So the, the kinds of buildings we build and how we design them interiorly teaches us a, lo a lot about what we believe about ourselves and about our, our common life together. So like you go into an academic building, I spend a lot of time in universities, and you go in different kinds of classrooms. Well, a classroom tells you a lot about, the architecture of the classroom tells you a lot about how the school, or at least the architect the school hired, thinks about that space. Uh, there's, there's rooms that are terribly functionary, cinder blocks, you know, lodged together. It's just like, you're here to make sure you learn the equations. Um, and and, it, and it, it's a kind of ruthless efficiency. Uh, th then there's, there's, you know, rooms that have vistas that you, you look out at some scene and you know it's, it's more ponderous. And it, it gives you a sense that truth is to be explored here and pondered. Okay, so we can apply this to churches, right? I mean, there's um, a lot of churches where the point seems to be, uh, we're modern too. We can do modern architecture just as well as you all can. We're gonna, do, we're gonna be more modern than you. We're gonna build like bunker houses. And uh, we're gonna have a gray monument to like modern imprisonment in you know, normal, like sameness, uh, you know. And I, there's famous cases of these, you know, these kinds of uh, brutalist, modernist, you know, poured concrete architecture that is supposed to like, uh, you know, wake us all up to the fact that we can be Catholic in modernity, but it seems like it's more like captive to modernity. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, the point isn't really about uh, making sure we stay in the Middle Ages, although there's a lot to be said for the Gothic or Romanesque styles. Uh, he says the guy from the medieval order, um, <laughs> uh, who, who prays in a Baroque chapel in Washington, D.C. But, um, but, but actually, I mean, the, the point is that a, 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 sac a sacred space opens you to a sense of the transcendence of God. That's one thing for sure, but also intimacy with God. You know, that, like this is a place where you can find intimacy with God in prayer and that God's transcendence is acknowledged. Uh, you know, so 
th there's a lot of, that could be said about this, but the point is how do we inhabit meaningfully a space? What do we think it is to live together as persons in the presence of God in a church or in the, in the search for the truth in a university and so forth? All right, let me just finish then by talking about beauty and evangelization. I started with the question, can beauty save the world? And um, I think the answer is no. Uh, I think the, the right answer, or maybe a more, a, a more perfect answer would say, uh, well, what saves the world is, is the grace of Christ. Uh, but the grace of Christ is expressed primarily in the truth of the gospel and in the moral goodness of evangelical living. So it's more like the truth of Christ and the goodness of Christ in his church, through grace, that's what saves the world, that's, that's fundamental, okay? But the truth of Christ and the goodness of Christ are beautiful. Uh, so some of the kinds of manifestations of beauty we do have control over can strongly express the beauty of Christ's truth and goodness and dispose people to receive the truth and goodness of Christ. So I wanna talk about that just a little bit here briefly. So I wanna go back to this idea of the beauty of the truth. I talked about people having like a beautiful argument or you could say a person has a beautiful mind. Well, um, when you talk about the, the, is the Catholic truth beautiful? Well, what's the integrity of it? Well, there's a lot of ways to talk about that, but just briefly, first of all, yeah, there's a coherence to it in itself. I mean, there's a certain kind of beauty to the mysteries of the faith. So when you understand Christ's sacrifice and then you understand the mass and then you understand the life of the saints, like these things hold together in a, in a beautiful integral way. But I think more to our age, we live in an age of deep fragmentation of learning. I mean, the modern university is in grave crisis in part because it's become a, a kind of high grade technical school where you learn different discourses and forms of expertise that are not unified. Like you know a lot about engineering or you know a lot about history or you know something about geography. But how do you put it all together and understand the world in a deeper perspective about what's real? Well, that's obviously about like ultimate philosophical questions. How do you put that together with major religious questions? What the Catholic tradition and Thomas Aquinas particularly give us is this kind of sense of the unity of all truth, the unity of what we learn mathematically or scientifically with what we can learn about the human being and what we can study in poetry and literature, with what we can learn philosophically, with what we can learn by faith in examined theologically and the mysteries of the faith. That unity, that holistic integrity, the proportionality between all the parts of learning, the splendor of the truth according to faith and reason, that is uh, something that is really sublime and wonderful that's in our tradition quite rightly uh, that we can use to evangelize. You know, so I do think Aquinas plays a major role for us today in speaking to brilliant young people who are in academic formation systems where they don't have a sense of the integrity and unity of the truth. They have a deep sense of fragmentation and frustration. And so when we approach them with the integrity and proportionality and splendor of the Catholic truth, it disposes them to believe that something is behind all this and perhaps that they really can encounter the truth and God in the Catholic faith. The second thing is moral beauty. Um, obviously, to have a life that is integrally, integrally, meaning holistically committed to Christ, is one of the most important sound, sort of signs of the presence of the grace of God. Okay, so um, I don't think it's enough to be like holy and not also have a way to present the truth. You, you know, the truth matters at least as much as personal holiness, but personal holiness matters as much as the truth. You'd say, well, personal holiness matters more for like heaven and being with God. Yes, that's true. But for evangelization, actually, the truth matters a lot. And so it's the truth and holiness, but holiness sort of moral beauty, that's, a lot of that's about the integrity of a life, that your life is holistically con, sort of committed to God and to Christ, that all the parts of your life proportionately come under the reign of God, including the things that, where you're weak and you're sinful and you like, integrally offer your sins to God in confession and, and in penance and in like hope. You become a being of, of, of hopeful, joyful repentance. And, uh, and, and there's a certain splendor then. In, you know, when Malcolm Muggeridge converted, to Christianity, it was from meeting Mother Teresa, and what was the book he wrote called? Something Beautiful for God. It was the integrity of her life, the kind of, the, the sort of beauty of charity lived out in, in, in integral 
honesty and, and humility and piety that was manifest in her holiness, and that integrity spoke to him, and through him, it spoke to thousands of people in his, in his writing. And so, and then I finally would say, you know, aesthetic beauty matters, because if you, if you really believe it, you manifest it in, in what you build, how you worship, uh, what you images and music you use and don't use in, holy lit in the sacred liturgy to dispose people to the virtues of piety and, uh, and a sense of the truth. You know, God is a very sublime, utterly sublime truth. And so when we approach him, we need to approach him in ways that manifest his beauty and his goodness in aesthetically true ways that, that, ra that give us a sense of his transcendence and his goodness. And that's why sacred art is so difficult. Sacred art is really challenging. One of the reasons Dante is a giant is because there's so much theological truth in Dante and there's so much moral depth. Dante's ex you know, understanding of the human condition, he's like a moral genius. That's so rare, of course it's rare. You know, that's why he's a giant. But it's, you, know, you can take the, the mo one, of the, one of the most perfect examples and his little cousins, you know, Mozart and Michelangelo and these other people, Giotto and Angelico, and you can then say, well, that, that's the kind of thing we aim for, you know, modestly, to create sort of places where we really manifest the goodness and truth of God. So that is the kind of basic idea I want to give you, and if I leave you with something, it's integrity, proportionality, and clarity, and clarity or splendor. That's a powerful definition. It goes very far. You can use it for a lot of things, and it's just a kind of an example of why I do think Aquinas remains a very powerful uh, resource for the new evangelization, for contemporary intellectual evangelization, to present the faith to our secular colleagues and to try to win them over to the deep truth about the human person, about creation, about God, and about Christ. So with that, I'll finish and I'll open the floor to questions. Thanks, that was awesome. Uh, I, I wanted to just begin the question with a, like, small illustration from my own life. So uh, my father is a, uh, he, he's a theologian, so I grew up like understanding the truth of the faith very intimately. Like I, I would go out and my favorite thing was to like get on apologetics forums and argue with Protestants. Uh, but I, that didn't actually keep me from wandering away from my faith. Uh, and it was actually experiencing God in in the music uh, at a youth group that really like transformed my life and began to, to change it. So like, I returned to the church in a lot of ways because of experiencing beauty. And so when I kind of came back, I, I looked at it and was like, wow, the Catholic Church used to be at the forefront of all architecture. It used to be at the forefront of art and music and sciences, but it seems like there's so little effort put into that now in the church, and I'm just wondering, like, from your perspective, why did that happen? Yeah, you know, I, I, I do think it's somewhat uh, culturally relative, w what you say, about, like, how much work is put into it. So, uh, I've visited France and Italy enough to know that um, even in modern times, there have been some success stories and some preservation of traditional forms of beauty um, and I would say also in the United States, actually, um, one thing you do find is uh, th through the generosity of a lot of people who are in invested in, in this issue, uh, there are people willing to actually build uh, new cathedrals or churches that uh, have a, a sort of noble architectural form. So, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I do think that if you go into, if you, this, the simple answer though to your question is modernism uh, as, a, as a movement across the board. You could look at it in, uh, which by the way, I don't demonize. I think there's a lot of uh, interesting things in sort of especially modern music. Uh, and I don't mean, you know, popular music. I mean like modern classical music. But um, I mean, if, if you look at what, like if, if you just take the era of Picasso and you look at, like, think about what Picasso is doing visually in deconstructing classical forms with cubism, um, and hyper-subjectivizing a painting as a as a perspective of a subject, uh, not really bringing out the integral form of a thing. And, and I, th I think it's very interesting, actually, Picasso. But it, it's a very strong move away from realism. And certainly, there's no transcendence. It's not a move toward God. It's it's the imminence of the subject interpreting reality very subject, you know, very kind of a 
through the prism of his perspective. I think that happened in a lot of ways in, in architecture and music. Uh, and it, it, it meant that we turned towards a, I would call it a kind of immanentism, you know, looking at beauty through a uh, human community without an openness to God. So I do actually think the secularization of Europe led to a lot of the modern architectural um, trends uh, and a lot of the music and visual arts trends and postmodernism has even made that more acute. And Catholics find themselves in a very difficult position because if we stay with our own traditional canons of medieval beauty uh, or even Renaissance or Baroque beauty, we can, f we can seem to be purely resistant to modernity. And if we engage, we might uh, mistranslate the mystery into something that's too benign. And so I think that's where we're trying to negotiate. You started mentioning that you have experience doing this in different universities. Yeah. And after you have taught, I was thinking how amazing it is if Catholic universities, we have the opportunity to make this synthesis of knowledge, beauty, different, um, try to break that, um, different systems of departments, right? Isolated, so right. we can bring it together through this idea. Which are some ideas, suggestions that you may have for a Catholic university to bring beauty into uh, this idea that you have? Uh, oh, well, I can answer that quite, that's a great question. I can answer that pretty straightforwardly. I mean, I, I think the, the unity of the university I agree with both Aquinas and John Henry Newman on this. The unity of the university is not assured through theology primarily, although that has an important role, but through philosophy and principally through metaphysics. Because it's through the intellectual discipline that tells our human nature how all our learning is united, that we understand how all our learning is united, and that's metaphysics. And the church rightly has insisted since the crisis of nominalism and Protestantism in the 14th through 16th centuries on the centrality of metaphysics. That's the key. But the next step is to have a philosophical metaphysics that examines what beauty is, and then to try to have interdepartmental or inner, you know, subject uh, conversations about that, which I think is the, one of the reasons we've invested the, mo the, the modern philosophical uh, trends in metaphysics and morals are extremely strong, but in aesthetics weak, in the sense that there are very few professors of aesthetics in universities and even fewer who are like grounded in the classical metaphysical tradition. So there are Catholic universities that have excellent departments devoted to traditional philosophy and metaphysics, and they have often a strong moral component. It, it's, it's where we could have more like dedication to like uh, the wing of aesthetics and beauty in its sort of um, aptitude for conversation that we could develop that more. Yeah. I, I, yes, Father. Uh, Father Thomas, first of all, I wanna say I appreciate very much the lucidity of your presentation on a deeply deep, uh, difficult philosophical topic of beauty to get to contain and to present. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, the reason why I'm, I'm asking, uh, uh, it's more not so much a question as observation, but I have a close friend who has moved away from the church and uh, recently has been on extended sabbatical in Spain and uh, finished the Portuguese uh, El Camino to Santiago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been overwhelmed uh, by the number of pictures he has sent either of processions or of churches or of altars or of uh, presentations of things religious. And so for me, there is some stirring that is going on. There is an allurement and I, I think the attractability that is happening um, um, is through beauty. And so the, the three qualities and the, the, the frameworks that you have given have been very helpful for me to enter into a, a new form of dialogue with him. Yeah, thank you. You know, I, I think uh, pilgrimage is very powerful. It's not an American custom, uh, but it's, it's very powerful partly because it's so uh, useless from the point of view of like our, our, our notions of American efficiency. Like you just leave everything behind and you go like walking, trying to find God for like weeks or months. And uh, 
the mementos, the aesthetic mementos of centuries of that in the Camino are expressions of the kind of depth of moral commitment and spiritual seeking for the truth. So it's like a perfect kind of expression of, you know, people's, I don't know what you want to call it, almost agonizing desires for today, we might say nostalgia for the truth or transcendent truth. And that um, the, there's a kind of moral beauty in the pilgrimage that is something very alien to our culture, but actually very sort of profound for our humanity. I think when Americans don't do things like that, we, we do other things that express our uh, spiritual longing, like uh, eat the entire box of Oreo cookies and watch uh, too many Netflix seri serials. But I, I, I mean, I, th I think in other words, we endure time less constructively. We, we medicate ourselves uh, in our senses to withstand temporality, and the pilgrimage is partly a different way of, of withstanding temporal existence patiently. Uh, yes, um, I'll, and I'll come to uh, this, your question, yes. Um, whenever I get into a discussion about beauty, um, you've presented it very objectively, but no. invariably the person will say, well, that, that oak tree is beautiful to you, right. not to me. Can you just... Oh, sure. Can you just comment a little on the place subjectivity or personal taste has in this whole discussion and maybe the limits that yeah, personal taste Yeah, that's has? always a question I get and I never know the answer to it. I'm always stumped by that. I, I mean, I think the first thing is, I mean, actually, you know, it used to be people would say, well, morality is objective, but, you know, beauty is subjective. Now they say morality is subjective and beauty is subjective and truth is subjective. Um, so it, it, beauty is actually now on a kind of more level playing field with everybody else in the transcendental <laughs> community. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I mean, I think it's harder to analyze than, than like what is real metaphysical truth about being or like what is really morally good or what is good in creation. I think it's harder to analyze beauty, but I think it's also that like the science of metaphysics and the science of morals, we just have less analysis of it. So the first thing I always do with those people is trot out the definition because I think, well, and then try to give the illustrations because I think there's a certain kind of a evidential, evidential character to them. And since they think it's all subjective, they have no going theory. And so in, a, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And in the land where everyone has only subjective conceptions, anybody who has any really good objective con uh, conceptions can have a, a lot of influence. Um, and especially if your con objective con conceptions are drawn from someone as intellectually potent as Thomas Aquinas. So, I mean, the first thing I do is sort of trot out the objective definition, but then I think there are um, places you can make room for subjectivity. So, for example, do you like Thai food? Well, some people would say it's kind of strange to combine things that are very salty and things that are very sweet. And I don't think it's, you know, when you, when you if you have, I don't know if you ever go to Indian restaurants, I mean, I don't go to restaurants that often, but I do sometimes go to restaurants. And it, you go to an Indian restaurant, and sometimes the waiters who are Indian say, well, that, that food, that plate is very beautiful. It's a very interesting Indian expression. You know, the food is beautiful. But actually, the food is beautiful because of the symmetry of the taste. There's integrity. Form. We can talk about the food. So the point is, I don't think Thai food is so beautiful because the, sea, the, the salty and the sweet, like, I don't, I don't get that, the pad Thai. But I have friends who swear by it. Well, maybe that's partly biological. You know, maybe I just have biological dispositions. Maybe I haven't educated my palate. So the other problem with subjectivity is maybe I haven't learned. Like, on the aesthetic level, maybe I like the guitar mass because I'm like the guy who's only ever eaten at a fast food restaurant and never really learned to appreciate a more kind of a delicate food. And, you know, so I don't really, you know, we see this in moral, in moral life. There's people who, like, somebody's being very sensitive morally and another person just doesn't even see it because they're kind of a little bit unrefined morally. And it's okay, but it's like you, you missed it. That, that person's being extremely thoughtful. You just didn't see it. And so I think with aesthetics, it's kind of like that. You, 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 you know, it's partly we kind of have to learn. You have to teach people what beauty is by giving them expressions of what is beautiful. And, but the definition of Aquinas helps them see there's something objective at stake. Father, thank you. Uh, I get asked a lot, uh, very, very frequently, uh, how to make or uh, what beauty is. I'm just going to tell them to ask you. Um, well, uh, on uh, Thomistic Institute, if you go to SoundCloud Thomistic Institute online, we have put up all our lectures, and uh, there's a bunch of lectures up there about beauty. So you can just send them online. They won't even have to <laughs> correspond with me. They can go here, okay. hear it up online. <laughs> 
Thank you. Uh, er, uh, really, in one of your uh, your opening opening uh, uh, sentences, you, you mentioned a relationship of beauty and mystery, uh, really a, in a relationship of a trace. So beauty as a sort of trace of mystery. Could you expand on that a little bit, please? Yeah, I mean, isn't I, I said that with with regards to Dostoevsky. So I did not talk in this. I did not mention in this talk. I'm going to try to do this very briefly. I did not mention in this talk how beauty is related to being, because Aquinas thinks everything is beautiful. Because thinks everything that exists is beautiful insofar as it has being. So insofar as anything exists, it has some kind of goodness for Aquinas and some kind of beauty. So people talk about, well, what is the goodness versus the beauty? Well, the goodness is like the perfection of a thing. So, um, you know, like we're going to experiment on mice. We need good subjects. So what we need are healthy mice that can really do everything a mice can do. We don't need sick mice. So we need good mice, perfect mice. They've kind of got a goodness to them in a sort of broad sense. Or like, if you're trying to be honest, are you really being honest? Like he's a good, he's a good honest person, meaning he's thoroughly, perfectly honest. Okay, so the goodness comes from a certain kind of perfection of a thing reaching its end or doing what it's supposed to do, being the kind of thing it is. A human being should be truthful. If you're truthful, you're, you, know, you have a good honesty. Beauty is a kind of splendor that emerges from the, uh, the attractiveness of the form of a thing. So when a thing has this kind of perfect form, it, it, it dazzles or it attracts. And so... What is that? That's kind of an opaque idea. It's not initially obvious what, that, uh, what I'm saying. But the point is that in a way, when you're looking at the beauty of like the tree, you're looking at the splendor of a form in its intelligibility. Like the mind can kind of wrestle with it. It can go into it and think about it. Uh, so beauty reveals the mind to itself. Because when I see things that are beautiful, I, I kind of, I'm gazing at things and I sort of see what my mind is for. But then I start to think, well, maybe there's a like maybe there's mind behind the mind. You know, maybe there's like a deeper intellect. Maybe there's some kind of trace of of a hidden truth that has created the world with beautiful forms. You see, it's a simple way to say it is the world is full of r beautiful splendid forms. That makes my intellect aware that I can gaze on splendid forms, but I didn't create those forms. So where do they come from? Well, that's mysterious. Maybe there's an author of beauty, but what is the author of beauty? That's mysterious. It's unknown. You know, beauty is like the homage to the trace of the mysterious or the homage to an unknown God. I'm going to take your question last, ma'am. You used the word useless a minute ago, and I, I think it's really important to understand that uh, the practical, efficient world that we live in isn't um, what? amenable to the beautiful that often comes as a gift or a surprise and it requires a kind of patience i wondered if you could talk a little bit about the mitigating well the forces that mitigate yes. against being receptive to the gift of the beautiful yeah okay so i mean technology and tech and technical efficiency are great strengths of american culture and I think when Americans travel abroad and come back somewhat disillusioned by what they find in terms of efficiency and technological capacity, sometimes in other cultures, they can sound very arrogant and very short-sighted. But th there's something true, too, because you know, the cultures have various strengths. Um, and it certainly represents something human, that we want technical efficiency, we want results, we're result-oriented persons, we're practical beings. And Aristotle and Aquinas talk about that, too. The, the problem is this, the more you ramp up efficiency, the more you're tempted to uh, put it in terms of Aristotelian causes, to look primarily at the material cause and the efficient cause. And like, we have a certain amount of process we have to get through to get from A to Z, so let's just burn through the stages as fast as we can and get there. And th first of all, as you're intimating, that creates a kind of activism of the mind, because it's practical, so it's not a speculative gazing on the beauty of reality. It's a kind of processing and making things happen. And in our practical intellect, we are supposed to do that. And there's a time for that, just like there's also a time to be contemplative. But the other side is uh, we might not be looking at what we're transforming that carefully. So, you know, like I'm sitting there processing, changing, effectuating change, but I'm not gazing. And uh, I mean, the stereotypical example is we're we're cutting down the redwood forest to make lumber, but we didn't stop and look at like the 
nobility and beauty of the trees. Okay, that's a terribly stereotypical uh, environmentalist example, but it's completely legitimate in itself. And the point is, you could you could kind of expand that in the way we. Um, another example is like how we use the internet. I think quite amazingly, actually, to get information, to be connected to people, to have visual stimuli and knowledge, but um, it also changes the way we think. It changes the rhythm at which we think because we don't take the time as much to read a book and stop and figure out whether we think an idea is true and be patient with an idea or discuss it with someone. So in a certain way, we're not as deeply connected with other people because of the superficial way we connect to other people. And I say this is a person who answers all my emails. But I think the challenge to remain kind of contemplative in our intellectual life, and so a culture of technology is a great advantage and opportunity, but it needs to be balanced with a culture of contemplation and truth seeking and a culture of genuine aesthetics. And that's a very difficult balance to maintain. So the church has a role there, I think, in the larger culture, because I think our contemporaries actually often feel technology saturated and uh, overwhelmed by the pressures of efficiency. Uh, millennials certainly are in reaction against my generation and the baby boomer generation in this respect of wanting more time uh, for leisure. But how do we channel that in a constructive di direction? I think the church has a lot of wisdom in that respect. Thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you.